Let's pray. Father, we we thank you. As uh, me and Linda were t- talking earlier, and we we prayed together that as things seem to change day by day with Jim, um, we're so thankful you don't change. You're the same yesterday, today, and forever. And you tell us in your word that you're able to do far more than we could ever ask or think. And so, Lord, we just ask you to heal. We ask you to heal Jim. We ask you to, Lord, uh, restore his health, restore his mind. We ask you to um, give doctors wisdom. We ask you to um, give Linda wisdom, her, her family wisdom as they make decisions. And, Lord, we ask that they would have peace, that they would have that peace that passes all understanding, and you would continue to strengthen them. And we just ask that all this would be for your glory, that you would um, get the praise and all the honor because you are worthy and you're the only one that can do this. And, Lord, uh, we pray as we talk about the different ministry needs in our area, different ministry needs we see in the church, Lord, we just pray, Lord, that you would lead each and every one of us into the place that you'd have us to serve, the place you have us to do it, the place that you've called us to where you will give us the grace to do what you want us to do in that place. And, Lord, we pray for the Pregnancy Center. We pray that you just bless them abundantly. Lord, that you would guard them, protect them. We pray for the homeless shelter over here, that you would bless them abundantly and those folks in there that may be at the bottom they feel like, but Lord, we just pray that you would give them the understanding to, and the, the grace to look at you and know that you can lift people out of the bottom and you give hope where there is no hope and you bring light where there's darkness. So Lord, we just pray that you would bless that place. And, um, Lord, we, uh, we thank you that we are who we are and we know it. We know who we are without you, but yet you still let us be a part of what you do. And we are so thankful and blessed that it's not us that goes and does it, that you do it through us. And so, Lord, give us um, the faith to step out. Give us the heart to seek, Lord, to be used by you in even places that may be way over our head, but it's not over your head. And, Lord, as we study your word, we know that um, your word is spiritually discerned. And so your word on our own in the flesh is way over our head. So we ask you to give us discernment spiritually to help us understand, speak to our hearts. You know, each and every one of us here this morning, what we need, where we're at, what we're going through. So, Lord, just do what only you can do. Speak to us. Speak through the mess. Speak through the noise and calm our hearts and change us. Make us who you'd have us to be. Let it all be for your glory, Lord Jesus, we pray. And we thank you. Amen. Um, Before we get into chapter 11, we want to remember for a minute that just kind of looking back over the book of 2 Corinthians and that Paul's been making a defense um, in the whole book. And in these last few chapters of 2 Corinthians, it's pretty, it's going to get pretty and it's been getting pretty personal, and Paul's been pouring his heart out to the to this church. And as we studied in uh, chapter 10 a few weeks ago, we saw Paul pleading with the Corinthians not to be deceived by those who are coming in to lead them into bondage. Um, and we talked about these folks. I think Pastor Jim touched on these folks last week. Uh, they were called the Judaizers. Um, I pronounced that different, but I'm just going to pronounce it that way. So... Um, these folks, they were Jews that were going around behind Paul and, and teaching uh, the churches that they needed to convert to Judaism before they could convert to Christianity. Um, they were teaching Jesus plus something. And while they were coming in and teaching that, they were also criticizing Paul. Um, they were trying to undercut Paul's teaching of grace to exalt their own teaching of the law. And in this, we see the reason for Paul's defense. I tell my kids, um, if somebody's talking about you, who cares, right? I mean, that means they're just leaving somebody else alone. And 
you know, the whole sticks and stones thing. Um, and this isn't a bad way for us to go about things. Like if somebody's talking about you, it's like, whatever. I mean, if you've not done nothing wrong, I just let it be. Um, so why should Paul care if these Jews and these Corinthians were talking about him? Uh, he wasn't even in Corinth anymore. I mean, it, what did it matter? It mattered for the gospel's sake. Um, Paul's been making a defense of his apostles, apostleship, this whole letter. But we've got to remember as we read this, he's really making a defense of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's not a, it's not a defense of him. It's a defense of Jesus in the gospel. So verse 1 of chapter 11. Oh, that you would bear with me in a little folly, and indeed you do bear with me. Um, as Paul continues here, he to make his defense against the Judaizers and their followers, he asked them to bear with him and what's going to sound like foolishness. It's going to sound like folly, what he's about to talk about for the next chapter or so. And remember the end of chapter 10, starting in verse 14, if you want to look back. It says, uh, Paul says, For we are not extending ourselves as though our authority did not extend to you, for it was to you that we came with the gospel of Christ, not boasting of things beyond measure, that is, in other men's labors, but having hope that as your faith is increased, we shall be greatly enlarged by you in, your, in our sphere to preach the gospel in the regions beyond you and not to boast in other, another man's uh, sphere of accomplishment. But he who glories, let him glory in the Lord. And Paul knew that only a fool boasted in himself. And as Paul continues here, it's going to sound like he's doing just that. And I, I think, you ever, um, you ever look back at who you used to be and you despise it? I remember when I, I hadn't been saved, but probably, I don't know, a couple few years, and I went to the pastor, I went to his house at night. I, I might have told you all this before, but he come out to his driveway, it's probably 10 o'clock at night, and I was just broken and slobbering and devastated, big heap of mess. And he's like, what's wrong? And I said, I don't want to go back to who I was. I'd rather die than go back to who I was. And I think Paul hated to sound like this, like he was boasting about something outside of the Lord. And I think it's because um, there was a time in his life before he knew Jesus that all he did was boast in who he was. You know what I mean? Um, that he was the a Hebrew of Hebrews, that um, when he that he would boast in how he'd attained a certain righteousness on his own merit. But that isn't who Paul was anymore. And in Philippians 3, when talking about all the clout he once had in the religious system, Paul says, but what things were gained to me, these I, I have counted loss for Christ. Yet indeed, I also count all things loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ, Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Paul had counted his achievements, all he had gained on his own as loss, so he could gain Christ. So I think he'd rather do anything than go back to sounding like his old self, his old religious self. But we see Paul's heart for these Corinthians, that he was willing to do whatever he could do to reach them. He, he was willing to crawl through glass for these folks. In verse 2, he says, For I am jealous for you with godly jealousy. If I have betrothed you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. Paul loved these Christians with the love of Christ. He says he, had a, he was jealous for them with a godly jealousy. And, and it's hard for us to understand in our flesh, um, it's hard for us to understand the jealousy of God. Uh, man's jealousy isn't like God's. Uh, man's jealousy is sinful. Uh, it's selfish. You know, we're, we're, our jealousy is jealous of what somebody else has that we don't. And God's jealousy is not of us, it's for us. He's jealous for our hearts. 
Um, he's jealous for our joy. He is jealous that we would have life and life abundantly. Um, he loves us, and he knows there is no life outside of him. Um, the other gods, the little G's, um, they come to steal, kill, and destroy because they are from Satan, and they are looking for someone to devour. They are liars and deceivers, but God has truth for us, uh, life for us. He has true joy, and he is jealous that we experience it. He says in Exodus chapter 20, he says, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. Now understand, he's not saying this because he's trying to be rigid and, and be mean. He's saying this to them because he knows outside of him there is death and destruction for them. You shall not make for yourselves a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them nor serve them, for I am the Lord your God. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing mercy to thousands to those who love me and keep my commandments. What kind of love would it be if God wasn't jealous for our good? It wouldn't be no love at all, right? And Paul had a godly jealousy for the Corinthians. He, he wasn't in competition with the Judaizers. He just wanted the Corinthians to have life. And Paul saw them like his children, uh, like a father would a daughter. He wanted to present them pure and chaste so they would uh, be ready to meet the one they were to marry, the one they were made for. And there's something pretty cool that was practiced in the Jewish culture of that day. Um, you can just do like a whole study, hours and, of study on just the, the way they would be betrothed and the marriage and the the customs around that and the foreshadowing that was in that of Christ. I mean, it's pretty amazing for time's sake. We can't do that today. But um, there was a, a really cool thing in that um, that period in the betrothment, and there was someone called the friend of the bridegroom, and he had an important job. And in Adam Clark's commentary, he describes the responsibility of the friend of the bridegroom. And it says, uh, to procure a husband for the, the job was to procure a husband for the virgin, to guard her, to bear testimony to her corporal and marital endowments. And it was upon this testimony of this friend that the bridegroom chose his bride. He was the internuncia between her and her spouse elect, carrying all messages from her to him and from him to her. For before marriage, this guy's obviously pointing to the crowd, you women were strictly guarded at home with their parents or friends. And we see that John the Baptist was a friend of the bridegroom as he came to repair the way. In John chapter 3, it says, Then there arose a dispute between John, some of John's disciples and the Jews about purification. And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, who was with you beyond the Jordan to whom you have testified? Behold, he is baptizing, and all are coming to him. Talking about Jesus. John answered and said, A man can receive nothing unless it has been given to him from heaven. You yourselves bear witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. He who has the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is fulfilled. He must increase, but I must decrease. He who comes from above is above all. He who is of the earth is earthly and speaks of the earth. He who comes from heaven is above all. This whole betrothment and this friend of the bridegroom, it's not about the friend. The focus is not about the friend. The, the friend is the one preparing. The friend is the one that's kind of an intercessor there. It's about the bridegroom. And John pointed the way, but not to himself. He pointed to Jesus. And Paul was a friend of the bridegroom. He was directing the Corinthians to Jesus. And he wanted to present them as a chaste virgin to Christ, to pretend, present them unstained from the world. And you might think, when we hear chaste virgin, unstained, uh, you might think, well, that counts me out. Uh, you, know, you don't know my past. You don't know what's, what, what has went on with me in my past. You don't know about me. But here's the truth, and, and thank God for this truth. Sinners are the ones in need of a, the physician, right? And, and here's the hard truth. There will be multitudes with sordid past and messed up lives in heaven. That's good truth. 
but there will be multitudes of self-righteous in hell. Amen? There'll be a lot of people that look like they got it together in hell, but there'll be prostitutes and alcoholics in heaven because of Jesus. It's by grace that we've been saved. It's Jesus and his righteousness that makes us pure. It's by his blood that we enter in. And when Paul refers to wanting to present them as a uh, chaste virgin, he's talking about spiritually, uh, that they wouldn't be defiled or corrupted by the world um, and by the sins and indulgences of the world. And that not only includes the hedonism of the flesh, that's not just a bunch of, like we would see, um, liberal living. Um, the, this also would be the flesh's desire to be godly, right? We talked about that on Easter. Um, it includes re- religiosity. Um, the, the indulgence of the flesh is not only something that you do to do what we would call blatant sins. It can also be that in the flesh you're trying to be righteous on your own. Either one of those things will end you up in a place that you don't want to end up. Verse 3, But I fear, lest somehow, as a serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he who comes preaches another Jesus whom we have not preached, or if you receive a different spirit which you have not received, or a different gospel which you have not accepted, you may well put up with it. Now you're going to hear me this morning say this a few times. You're going to hear me say, it's simple, it's simple. You're going to get tired of hearing it. But there's a simplicity that's in Christ. Paul understood the battle was always and will always be the corruption of the simplicity and purity that's only found in Jesus. The enemy is always trying to corrupt the bride. And that's a fact. Would you guys agree with that? And we see Paul speak to this, and I mean, he was dealing with this all over the place, not just in Corinth. And we'll see him speak to this um, in the letter to the Galatians. In chapter 5, he says, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free. And do not be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Indeed, I, Paul, say to you that if you become circumcised, Christ will profit you nothing. And I testify again to every man who becomes circumcised that he is a debtor to keep the whole law. You have become estranged from Christ. You you who attempt to be justified by law, you have fallen from grace. For we, through the Spirit, eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything, but faith working through love. We see Paul speak to this again in Philippians in chapter 3. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. For me to write the same thing to you is not tedious, but for you it is safe. He keeps reminding them, beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the mutilation, the circumcision. For we are the circumcision who worship God in the Spirit, Rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. And many other places we'll see as we go verse by verse to the scripture, Paul speaks to this. And he knew he had to keep repeating it because it was going to continue to be a problem. And it's still a problem today. We don't argue about who's going to be circumcised, but we, we, there's all these um, Jesus plus something. And I want to spend a little bit of time here. I, I want to drive this home. This is so important, and we really need to get this. The enemy wants to complicate everything. And he wants us to believe everything has to be complicated. But it doesn't have to be. I'm going to, so I'm going to share this. And I don't know how this is going to come out. So y'all, most of y'all know my heart. And if anybody goes, what the heck was he talking about? Just go, I know his heart. It's okay. <laughs> so we were in Ohio. I went and visited my dad. And um, we, were at a, we were coming up from in southeast Ohio, and we come to this mall. And we went to this mall. And we came up to this store. I don't even know what the name was. It's kind of a, y- y- y'all familiar with Earthbound, uh, kind of like a, what we call a hippie store. Nothing against hippies, but a hippie store. Hippies cool now, so it's like, it's okay. Um, but... It wasn't earthbound, but it had, you know, you see all the stuff in there. So I came to the threshold of the, you know, the doorways at the mall to the stores are like 25, 30 feet wide. Well, I came to the threshold and I was looking in this store and it was not your typical hippie store. It was basically 
Pagans are us. I mean, it was like, um, <laughs> it was little idols all the way through there, you know, uh, books on this, books on that, books on, you know, Wicca, uh, crystals, all, all that stuff. And so there was a time when I, before I became saved, that I was into some of that stuff. Actually, there was many times in my past that I was kind of into that stuff. So when I got saved, I realized what the power was behind those things, right? I realized that wasn't that God that was saying it was that God, or I realized that that spell or that thing behind that moving that crystal around was not okay. Those were demons, spirits behind those things. And when I realized that, I was scared to death because of what I had opened myself up to, and I never wanted to open myself up to something like that again. Well, I was scared to almost like a panic for years. I, I just saw that stuff and just the other way. And that's okay if that's what you need to do. But I realized something when I was standing. I probably looked really funny standing on that threshold for so long. People were probably just looking at me as I was staring in. But I realized those gods got no power over me. There is no... There is nothing in there that has power over me. Now, if I go submit myself to something, that's a different story. But on, it, just in the face value of it, there's nothing in there that's probably just not walking on, around all out there. And if we're not careful, we can get so focused on the enemy that we can take our eyes off the Lord and what the point of this whole battle is for, and this, which is to spread the gospel. We can get so paranoid and, and took away by the enemy that we take our eyes off of Jesus and really what's going on. And we, we don't want to be ignorant of the enemy's devices and his schemes, but his scheme, we have to understand this, is to kill, steal, and destroy people, deceive them so they won't know Jesus. So the, the, what we have to give back to that is the gospel. We combat that with the gospel. He doesn't want them to know I looked around that store, and there was, um, I stepped across the threshold, and I went in, and I walked around the store, and as I walked around, I kind of was like, man, I can't believe I was deceived by this stuff. I can't believe I was just hooked by this stuff. And I was listening to the people that worked there explain, you know, these crystals do this, and this thing does that, and this, and I felt so sad for them. I didn't see them as my enemy. I felt pity because they're deceived and they're being led in destruction. And the thing is, I know the way to life. I got it. I don't have to be afraid of some statues. I have the Holy Spirit of the Most High in me. The demons are scared of who's in me. Jesus said the gates of hell will not prevail against his church. My focus needs to be and my heart needs to be on simply sharing Jesus, the power of God unto salvation, deliverance, freedom. Amen? Amen. God makes it simple for us. It, it's it's, it's kind of like this, it's, and we've talked about this before. It's God's way, or it's a multitude of ways the world has for us, right? Uh, man, <laughs> we love, mankind loves choices. We love options. I remember when I was a kid, we had three stations, and you had to go out and turn the antenna to get those, and you had to yell in, and, and they tell you, yeah, back, back, no, back the other way. And it was simple, right? You, you didn't want to go out there and do that, especially in the winter. You just watched the station you had. <laughs> now we have hundreds of stations. But the more we have, it seems like the more stressed out we become. We're not made, listen, we're not made for complicated. We're created for a purpose. Purpose. We, we fit somewhere. Satan wants to complicate things for us. He wants to draw us away from the simplicity we first came to Jesus with. To draw us away from our first love. It, it wasn't, he talks about Eve here being deceived. It wasn't complicated for Eve and Adam, right? Before the fall. Adam and Eve were in the garden that God made for them. They walked with God. They talked with God. They walked in the purposes and plans that God made them for. 
Life for them, I have no doubt, was full of joy. Life was simple. Can you imagine being where God has for you? Perfectness and getting to walk and talk with him and hang out with him. Then Satan came and he complicated things by questioning the simplicity of God's truth. In Genesis 3, 1, it says, Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? He came right away and complicated what God had said. Did you say? Did God say you couldn't eat of every tree? You see how Satan um, didn't come with uh, what God said they could do, right? It wasn't. He didn't emphasize, um, you know, that God had provided everything they needed and all they had was in the Lord. And um, he pointed to the one thing that they weren't permitted to do. Ain't that crazy? How he does with us? Does he ever? Do you ever hear the temptation ever come? Man, you're so blessed. You've got so much. God's been so good to you. No, it's. If you just had that, if this thing was just in your life and the doubt so, like, why, why won't God let you do that? In verse two in uh, Genesis, it says, and the woman said to the serpent, we ha- we may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Satan convinced, he, he, he sowed the seed, right, of doubt. Then he, he watered it. And then he convinced them that God was holding out on them. That they were made for you know, something more than all that garden had to offer. That they were made to be like God that they didn't need God, that they could do this thing on their own. And we know what Adam and Eve found out after they ate, that eating this tree took man out of their purpose. It separated them from God and life, it separated them from life and his complete care. And this separation from God, did, it did bring death. It didn't bring it instantaneously, but it brought spiritual death and eventual physical death. Because there is no life outside of God and his ways. And Satan is still trying to complicate the gospel. And, and many times, and this is, this is crazy to think about, but it's the truth. And we can accept it. We can, we can acknowledge it. That many times, even those of us who are saved, who know Jesus, and we've experienced life in him, are not content to just be with Jesus in his grace. We, we're not content to just be little children um, to just be with our first love. When given instructions to Timothy in uh, 1 Timothy chapter 6, Paul says, If anyone teaches otherwise and does not consent to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrines which, accor- which accords with godliness, he is proud, knowing nothing, but, it, but is obsessed with disputes and arguments over words from which come evil, strife, reviling, evil suspicions, useless wranglings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth, who suppose that godliness is a means of gain. From such withdraw yourself. Now godliness with contentment is great gain. We need to grab a hold of the simplicity in Christ. We need to seek to be content in the simple gospel of Jesus. There's one thing the enemy uses to keep us from doing this. Pastor Jim alluded to this last week when he was talking about funerals. The the common denominator he uses to complicate things, he gets us to make it about us and not about Jesus. It it could be something that seems good, and that's why it's so subtle. But if it's Jesus plus abstaining from this food, or if it's Jesus plus worshiping on a certain day of the week, or if it's Jesus plus this party affiliation, or if it's Jesus plus anything, it makes it about us and not Jesus. If you want to complicate things, it's real simple. Make it about you. God has one way, and he is that way. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through him. If we want to experience God in his ways, You guessed it. He made it simple. 
We just have to choose him. It's simple. It sound, it seems complicated a lot of times, like choose God or choose this. This is there's just so many options. No. All these options go over here, and then there's God. So you've got two options. If you uh, turn to uh, Joshua chapter 24. We're going to start in the first verse. And I I want you to, we're going to read a little bit here. um, But there's a purpose in this. And I want you to really get what God is speaking to the children of Israel here and what he's trying to show them in the big picture. It says, Then Joshua gathered all the tribes of Israel to Shechem and called for the elders of Israel, for their heads, for their judges, and for their officers. And they presented themselves before God. And Joshua said to all the people, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, your fathers, including Terah, the father of Abraham, Terah, the father and the father of Abraham and the father of Naor, dwelt in the other side on the other side of the river in old times, and they served other gods. Then I took your father Abraham from the other side of the river, led him throughout all the land of Canaan, and multiplied his descendants and gave them him Isaac. To Isaac I gave Jacob and Esau. To Esau I gave the mountains of Seir to possess, but Jacob and his children went down to Egypt. Also, I sent Moses and Aaron, and I plagued Egypt according to what I did among them. Afterward, I brought you out. Then I brought your fathers out of Egypt, and you came to the sea, and the Egyptians pursued your fathers with chariots and horsemen to the Red Sea. So they cried out to the Lord, and he put darkness between you and the Egyptians, brought the sea upon them, and covered them. And your eyes saw what I did in Egypt. Then you dwelt in the wilderness a long time, and I brought you into the land of the Amorites, who dwell on the other side of the Jordan, and they fought with you. But I gave them into your hand that you might possess their land, and I destroyed them from before you. Then Balak, the son of Zippor, king of Moab, arose to make war against Israel, and sent and called Balaam, the son of Beor, to curse you. But I would not listen to Balaam. Therefore he committed, continued to bless you. So I delivered you out of his hand. Then you went over the Jordan and came to Jericho, and the men of Jericho fought against you. You see this, what's happening here, right? They're rising up against them, God delivers them. Somebody rises up against them, God delivers them. Then you went over the Jordan and came to Jericho, and the men of Jericho fought against you. Also the Amorites, the Parasites, the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Gergeshites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. But I delivered them into your hand. I sent the hornet before you, which drove them out from before you. Also the two kings of the Amorites, but not with your sword or with your bow. I have given you a land for which you did not labor and cities which you did not build and you dwell in them. You eat of the vineyards and olive groves which you did not plant. Now, therefore, fear the Lord. Serve him in sincerity and in truth and put away the gods which your father served on the other side of the river in Egypt. Serve the Lord. And if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourself this day whom you will serve whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. God's saying to them and to us, look back, decide for yourselves who loves you. Like look at your life. Look what all the other stuff did in your life and then look what God has done. How's things, how were things on your own? How'd that go? How was uh, chasing the next thing to come along? You know, how'd that satisfy you? And then ask, who's always been faithful to you? Who's always been your deliverer and provider? Who's been the one who's loved you? Who's the one that died for you so you could have forgiveness of your sins and have life eternal? Now choose. It makes it pretty simple, right? And that's kind of how we have to think. Uh, This is what it's saying in Romans chapter 12, verse 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. It makes sense for us to give ourselves to God. It's reasonable because of who God is and because of what he's done. 
the choice is simple. It's good and bad. There's light and there's darkness. We were in Ohio. I got another Ohio story. I got to go out of town more. <laughs> we were, we, when we left southeast Ohio, we ended up uh, going up in the more of the middle of Ohio where my dad lives, and we stayed in this old farmhouse out in the middle of the cornfields. And uh, corn's cut right now, so you can just see forever. And in the daytime, Joby was with us, and in the daytime, she wasn't scared of that house. We left one day, and she hung out there for hours by herself with nobody around. I mean, for you know, several miles, just out there having a time. But at nighttime, it was different because she couldn't see what was happening. You know what I mean? The same house, same fields, same everything. In fact, we were there with her at night, and she was like, that girl turned every light on that she could find to turn on. It looked like probably a spaceship out in one corner of that house. She made it at nighttime. What she did is she made it as simple as she could make it. You understand? Like she turned the lights on because she wanted to see what was happening. She was trying to make it simple. In the daylight, it's simple, right? In the dark, it becomes complicated because we can't see. In John chapter 8, verse 12, it says, Then Jesus spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. Jesus is the light. In 1 John chapter 1, it says, if, you say that, if we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Things get real simple in the light. Things get real simple in Jesus. The problem is that in the world we live in, darkness is always present. Would you agree? And because of our Adam nature that's in all of us, instead of like bugs being drawn to the light, we're drawn to darkness. Jesus said in John 3.20, For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. And there's the battle. It's Romans 7. It lays it out really well. Starting in verse 21, it says, I find then a law that evil is present with me, the one who wills to do good. For I delight in the law of God according to the inward man, but I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. This battle inside of us is overwhelming sometimes. And it's a battle that we can't win. But we see the simple answer to this in Romans chapter 7, starting in verse 24. O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with my mind I myself serve the law of God, but with my flesh the law of sin. Jesus is deliverer. He is the answer. He's the only answer. And here's what's so great. He is faithful. He will never leave you nor forsake you. That's a promise. So even though darkness is all around, we don't fear. Because Jesus is our ever-present help in time of need. He was before all. He is far above all. And in him, there is no darkness. John chapter 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. In Jesus, we don't have to be overcome. We don't have to be afraid. We don't have to be confused. We can just be still and know that he is God. So the answer, it sounds so simple and it sounds so practical, is that we stay near him and keep our minds and our eyes on him and on, in his word, which is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Right? And the Corinthians were struggling with this. 
um, like all of us do. They, they were putting their eyes on the peripheral. And uh, if we're not careful to do, to just keep our eyes on Jesus and on his word, we'll be caught up just like the Corinthians were. And we'll let something be added. And, and I want you to understand this as we get into this next verse. This is very scary business. This is very important stuff. Look at verse 4 again. For if he who comes preaches another Jesus whom we have not preached, or if you receive a different spirit which you have not received, or a different gospel which you have not accepted, you may well put up with it. You notice he says a different Jesus. It's not like um, Paul's not talking about them going back to Aphrodite or going back and worshiping Zeus or going back to the temple prostitutes. He's saying a different Jesus. He's talking about them following Jesus plus something, which makes it a different Jesus altogether. That's what's so crazy is that, you know, we might think, well, it's Jesus and it's just plus something. No, when you add anything to salvation besides just Jesus' finished work, you are making him a different Jesus altogether. Because Jesus said at his cross, he said, it is finished. It is paid in full. There is no additions needed. This Jesus plus something can be so subtle. Uh, It can be tricky because they name the name of Jesus but just slip in a little something for us to do, uh, for us to add to the equation, which complicates the whole thing. Um, And this is life or death stuff. Uh, Paul was jealous over this. This is what Paul was jealous for. In Galatians chapter 1, he says, I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel, which is not another. But there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you, let him be accursed, anathema. As we have said before, so now I say again, he repeats it. If anyone preaches any other gospel to you than what you have received, let him be accursed. Paul says if someone brings Jesus plus something, let him be accursed accursed. That's pretty extreme. That's pretty serious. And when we look at it, we understand why. As we talked on Easter, this gospel is what the whole thing is about. All creation and all history is pointing to the cross of Jesus Christ. And we, when we mess with the gospel, we're messing with the very thing that we celebrated on Easter. The finished work of Jesus for the salvation of the world. When you mess, when you add something to Jesus, you're messing with John three sixteen, for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him, I mean, you're messing with all of it, the things that we hold dear, our faith, grace. If we add to Jesus, we're we're making it something completely different. And Paul was warning the Corinthians. Because he understood that they were attracted to these false apostles. They were attracted to this Jesus plus something. He says, you may well put up with it. My grandpa, he would always quote, he never quoted a lot of Bible verses to me, but he quoted Ecclesiastes. He always said, there's nothing new under the sun. Christians still struggle with this Jesus plus stuff. There's nothing new. It's just different looking. And we divide over it. Pastor Jim taught a great teaching last week on unity and the rarity of it. And and this is why it's so rare. Because we're drawn to bring our own opinion, our own strength. Jesus plus something. And in doing so, we make the gospel something different entirely. And it divides us up. And there's a lot of us Christians, and, and, you know, there's a lot of us. I mean, I don't know how many are in here today. We don't count people. There's, a, there's several of us in here today, right? And there's several in Cherokee County that are meeting across the county today. There's a lot of us, and, and, and we bring a lot of stuff with us, right? We all bring in stuff with us. Here's the thing, though. There's one Jesus. There's one Word of God. There's one light. There's one that brings salvation, Our common ground is him. It's not all of our stuff. It's not our opinions. It's not our strength. It's not what I like and what you, it's Jesus and his word. That's what brings us together. And we don't become moral because we follow the law. 
We have morality because we have the righteousness of Jesus applied to our lives. We have the fruits of the Holy Spirit only. If you have the fruits of the Holy Spirit, it's only because you have the Holy Spirit in you. And here's the thing, and this is, it just gets, I'm going to say this and I'm going to leave it alone, maybe. (laughs) If someone adds to the gospel of Jesus Christ or changes it, it's not the saving gospel anymore. We got to be careful. And you know what? There'll be those that come in among us that try to bring Jesus plus something. It's going to happen. I'm sure it already has. In fact, I know it already has. Certain certain times, I'm not pointing at no, nobody here. Um, but I'm not scared of that. You know why? Because we keep it simple. If if we keep it, Jesus Christ and Him crucified. If we all seek to be of one mind and one accord in Jesus, then no Jesus plus anything will make it here. It'll be called out. It'll be put down. And hopefully, and here's the thing, my heart is that hopefully that person that brings it in will be encouraged to accept the simple, pure gospel. Or maybe they're a Christian, they just got off course, which we all can do. And they'll maybe, hopefully they'd be encouraged to come back to their first love, to just come to Jesus like a child again, to rest in him, and just rest in his love and his grace. And, and, you know, and of course, if, if they persist, if, you know, if they, it's Jesus plus something, Jesus plus something, um, that it, it would break our hearts, but that person would be asked to leave. But what a, what a heartbreaking thing to take a person that's being deceived and put them back into the dark. We have the light to share. Amen? Amen. Let's pray we can all stay focused on the simple truths of God's word and his grace and then we can share it with the world. Um, Pastor Jim is on the DL today. Um, he, uh, if, you, if you want to, ask him about his finger. He hurt his finger. <laughs> gotcha. Um, so we won't be um, having him come up to play or the worship team, but um, I just want to close with this. Uh, This is a simple teaching today, right? Literally. Uh, It's Jesus Christ and him crucified. And and understand this. I want to clarify this because I I think if I wasn't uh, paying attention, I I could think I was saying something else. I'm not saying God is simple. I'm saying he's made it simple for us. God is amazing. He is immeasurable. He is vast. His ways are above our ways. He is into all the intricacies and all the details, as far out as you want to go and as small down as you want to go. He's into all the cells, the molecules, the the things that we have no clue about still. He's into all that. But here's the thing. None of that is complicated, a complicating thing to him. He doesn't look at the cell and go, wow, that's just so complicated. I'm so stressed out. (laughs) It doesn't complicate him. None of the things that are complicated to us are complicating to him. Does that make sense? He, what he understands, Satan come to Eve and said, you can understand what God knows. And they weren't ready for that. They weren't made for that. God had made it simple for them. And God has made it simple for us. What he knows is too high for us. It's too much for us. And he makes it simple. And in him, here's the thing. Would we rather have confusion or complication or what we have in him? We get the fruits of the Spirit in him. We get love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. In Jesus we have life. And it's always, it's, it was, from the beginning it was always supposed to be this way. And even after the fall, God's been pointing to this. I want to read something to you. It's only going to take a few more minutes, but it's, I love this. Um, this is in Deuteronomy chapter 30, and it's, uh, it won't be on your screen, but if you want to look it up. But um, Moses addressed, he's addressing the, the children of Israel here about keeping their, heart, their hearts devoted to God. And I want you to hear what God's got to say. This is ap- after the fall, of course, pre-New uh, Testament, pre-New Covenant. 
You see if God's not just pointing to the same thing all the time. We're going to be starting in uh, verse 15. See, I have set before you today life and good, death and evil, and that I command you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in his ways and to keep his commandments, his statutes and his judgments, that you may live and multiply, and the Lord your God will bless you in the land which you go to possess. But if your heart turns away so that you do not hear and are drawn away and worship other gods and serve them, I announce to you today that you shall surely perish. You shall not prolong your days in the land which you cross over the Jordan to go in and possess. And listen, I love this part here. I call heaven and earth as witnesses today against you that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that both you and your descendants may live, that you may love the Lord your God, that you may obey his voice and that you may cling to him. I love that. Cling to him, for he is your life and the length of your days, and that you may dwell in the land which the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give them. This has always been God's heart, that we cling to him, that we love him, that we fully rely on him. And, and, you know, I don't know what seeks to pull you away from the simplicity in Jesus. Uh, all of us have something, maybe it's fear, maybe it's lust, maybe it's pride. I don't know, you probably do. But I want to encourage you, make it simple. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Keep your eyes on his word. If you take your eyes off, put your eyes back on him. Don't keep going after your own stuff, and after the destruction, and just try the one thing after another thing after another thing. Most of, if you've not done that yet, like if you're young enough to where you've not already went through the gamut of things that don't work, come talk to some of us and we'll let you know how that goes. <laughs> don't do that. Get your eyes on Jesus. Get your eyes on, on his word. Come to him. Submit yourselves to him. And I'm going to say this, and I hope, I hope you hear this, hear my heart here too. If you see chaos and confusion in your life, and this isn't always the case, but if you have chaos and confusion that's persistent in your life, it's probably an indicator that the enemy's getting your eyes somewhere else. That things have gotten complicated. Just make it simple. And, and as the world continues to divide, let's pray that the Lord gives us the grace to stay in him, to be unified in him, just him. And then we can go and share this simple gospel with the rest of the world. And if you're here and you don't know Jesus, and you know if you've not heard everything I've just said, it's simple. He made it simple for you. You don't have to jump through hoops. You don't have to like all of a sudden measure up on your own and then come. Jesus gives an invitation in Matthew chapter 11. He says, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. If you don't know Jesus, come to him this morning. Lay your life at his feet. He will not refuse you. Every Christian here had to come the same way. Through Jesus and nothing else. So just simply come. 